So one Sunday I was sitting in, a, sitting in church at DCC and our former senior pastor, Jeff Stone, had brought a guest speaker in. The guy's name was Barry Cameron. He was preaching on a book that he had written called The ABCs of Financial Freedom. Up to that day, I had never given any thought to this question. What is God's will for me and my money? What is God's will for me and and my money. But something stirred inside of me that day that would set me on a journey of the last 14 years that has literally transformed my life. And here is the interesting thing about the journey. Everything that I've learned can be traced back to God's word. There's a guy named Howard Dayton who is a Christian financial expert. I'll have to trust his word. He did the research. He said the Bible references money and possessions at least 2,350 times. That is more than Jesus talked about love. That is more than Jesus talked about heaven and hell combined. So I think it's safe to say this topic, even though Bob's topic was very, very important, this topic is very, very important. So by the time we walk out of here this evening. I'm going to give you four, and I usually have the lap, laptop there, so I'm going to have to get used to this. By the time we finish up tonight, I'm going to give you four tools that you can use, that I've used, that are simple, repeatable, and they're always relevant. They are timeless. So the first tool I'm going to give you, and some of this stuff is in your handouts. I, I gave you one handout where you could just take your own notes. The first tools I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you four heart perspectives to make sure that your heart is in alignment with God's will for you and your money. Because when there is alignment, you have peace of mind. The second tool I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you a framework for assessing your current financial health so that you can be intentional with your spending decisions and you can prioritize them. Third tool I'm going to give you is I'm going to give you five timeless habits. They work at any income level in any economic scenario. And the last tool I'm going to give you is hope for a great future. Because when you live all the other stuff, ultimately you end up with financial margin, which is basically having extra dollars. And when you have extra dollars, you can be more generous, and hopefully you can be all that God has called you to be. And all of this is going to come to you in your hand out there in what I call the four H's of financial wisdom. So let's go ahead and dive into the first H. So Capital One wants to know what's in your wallet. Everybody loves the Charles Barkley commercials. Every, Capital One wants to know what's in your wallet. God wants to know what's in your heart. And if you think about it, all money issues are heart issues. Matthew 6, 21 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 14 years ago, when Barry Cameron was doing the sermon at DCC, he told the following story. He said, a congressman took his young son to McDonald's, got him a large order of French fries and a Coke. They went over and they sat down in the booth. And while they're sitting there, the father reached over to grab a couple of those great fries. And as he did it, the son took his hands and pulled the fries back. And the father thought to himself, what is he doing? I just bought him those fries. As a matter of fact, if I want, I go buy all the fries that I want. I just want to share a couple of fries with him. And then it occurred to the father that he had been acting the same way with God that his son was acting with him that God had blessed him with so much, and yet he found himself taking his hands and putting it around his stuff and pulling it back. And God was probably sitting there saying, what are you doing? I blessed you with everything. I just want to share it with you. So guys, the mistake that we can't make is thinking that they are our fries, because they're not, they are God's fries. So as I sat there on that Sunday morning, listening to the sermon, listening to the story, I thought to myself, I'm the son too. Because I'm like a lot of other people. I worked hard. I got educated. It's my money. I can do whatever I want. 
So when the service ended, I ran down the hallway to see if Barry Cameron's book was in the bookstore. And of course it was there because he was speaking in the church. And I bought the book and I think I read it in about a week. And it convicted me so much that I actually wrote a note in the front of the book. Here's the actual book. I don't know if it's still in the bookstore, but here's what I wrote. This was literally July 2nd, 2008. Dear God, it's official. I am following you. I am a tither. I will start this Sunday at church. It will be based on my previous month's income. I'm very excited to do your will. My faith is in you, and I know you will take care of me and my family. In Malachi, you said to test you. I'm doing that knowing you will bless me in a massive way. I look forward to the journey, your humble servant, Mike, July 2nd, 2008. Now, writing a note in a book to God is one thing, but living this is another. And just to show you that God has a sense of humor, does anybody remember what happened in 2008, 2009? The Great Recession, and so my commitment to God was like wavering. And I happened to make my living in the financial planning and investment business, so it was very, very scary. And I would like to tell all of you that over the last 14 years, aside from that event, that it's just been a straight up trajectory. But the reality is it hasn't. I've gotten sideways more times than I can count. I've doubted. I've wondered, am I doing the right thing? But I've stayed with it for 14 years. So when I struggle to do money God's way, I try to go back to what I call the four heart perspectives. And that's what I want to share with you right now. So the first one, and I heard Paul said something about this, is stewardship. Do you believe that God owns it all? Because if you don't, you might as well just quit right now. You've got to believe that God owns it all. Psalm 24, 1, I don't think it can be any clearer than that. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And I can tell you, 14 years ago, I did not believe that God owned it all. The second hard perspective is faith. Do I demonstrate my faith through my finances? Now, many of you know, uh, we have, a, pro we have a, a thing going on in the church right now called Go Beyond, which is our big stewardship campaign. And that's an example of where we will demonstrate our faith through our finances. I went to the church the other day to deliver my envelope as one of the early people to do that, and there was nobody there. They were in a meeting, and I, I texted Paul, and I said, what do I do with my envelope? And I put it in the mailbox at church. But that envelope, as I delivered it to the church, was a demonstration of my faith through the finances. And from what I hear, it sounds like the, the church is off to a great start with the, the Go Beyond campaign. The third one. Um, I'm a business guy, I've been in business for about 30 years. Um, I've needed a lot of wisdom to get through the last 30 years, um, and it never, it never ends. And so where my heart always rests is in this scripture from James 1.5, which is, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So do you believe that God's wisdom is true and available? I believe it is. I have, I have leaned into that more times than you can imagine. And then the last one is contentment. Is what I have right now enough? I, I do videos and they, we throw them on my website. I just did one on contentment. I said, if contentment was about having stuff, the United States would be the most content country on planet Earth. And we're not even near the top of the list. Now, Ron Blue, who's a co-founder of Kingdom Advisors, I love this story he tells. He was in Africa. He was sitting up on a hillside with a local pastor, and they're looking down on the guy's mud hut. Off to the side, his two-year-old daughter was making a toy out of a used battery. And Ron turned to the, the pastor and said, what is the greatest barrier to the spread of the gospel in this part of the world? And the answer blew Ron away because he was expecting something different. The pastor turned to Ron Blue and he said, the biggest barrier to the spread of the gospel is materialism. 
You see, if a man has a mud hut, he wants a stone hut. If a man has a thatch roof, he wants a metal roof. The thing is, guys, materialism, no matter the context, it always drives you to want more, but leaves you perpetually discontent in your pursuit of it. I believe that materialism is not a wealth disease. It is a heart disease. It is a heart disease. So the question I have for all of you tonight is, where is your heart right now as it pertains to those four heart perspectives? Where is your heart right now? Because as I said before, all money issues are heart issues. All money issues are heart issues. And here's the thing. We got to get our hearts right first because out of our hearts come our beliefs and out of our beliefs come our behaviors. You can't change behavior until you change your heart. And that's why this first H is so, so important. So let's talk a little bit about behavior. So you get your heart right. The second H is health. And this is related to your current financial health. You have got to come to an understanding of where is the money coming from and where is the money going? Where is the money coming from? Where is the money going? Billy Graham said the following. He said, show me your checkbook. I'll show you where you are in your walk with the Lord. We could all put our checkbooks out right now and we could all figure out where we are in our walk with the Lord. 14 years ago, I knew how to reconcile a checkbook because I'm a former CPA, but I can tell you my checkbook did not line up with where I wanted to be in my walk with the Lord. All spending decisions are spiritual decisions. If you're trying to figure out whether you should buy something or whatever, you need to take it to the Lord. Now, through my professional involvement with Kingdom Advisors, I've come across a framework that has worked for me, it's worked for my clients, um, and we affectionately call it Oh, Grow, Live, and Give. And I'm going to take you through the framework real quickly. So one of the things I always talk about is the pie don't lie. And, and this, works, this works in any person's situation. So if you take the circumference of the pie, that is the provision that God has given you. And if we went around the room, we all have different size pies. We know Holdcamp's got the biggest pie because he's the president. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love Bob. Bob and I are in, we're in life group together, and he's, he, whenever I need somebody to talk to, he's my guy. Um, but that represents the provision that God has given you. The O part of O grow, o, o grow Live, Give, O is broken up into two. You got taxes. We all just came through April the 18th. Hopefully you all paid some taxes. As Ron Blue says, when you pay taxes, you should get on your hands and knees and you should thank the Almighty Lord that you're paying taxes because if he gave you no provision, you'd have no taxes. Now I say that and I think it's like over 50% of the people in this country don't pay any federal taxes, but that's another issue. The other part of O is debt. Debt payments, I'm going to talk about debt in a minute. Grow would be money that you are saving for your future, your future goals, your future dreams. Live would be your living expenses. Um, and guess what? You have the discretion to choose the lifestyle you want. And that's between you and God. Sometimes people come to me and they're like, well, what do you think about my lifestyle? I think nothing. That's between you and God. I love this scripture from 1 Timothy 5.8. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And then the last piece of the pie is Give which ultimately we're trying to create financial margin so you all can be more generous. All right, there's three inherent lessons within the pie. Number one, all those pieces of the pie are competing with each other. They all, they all want a piece of the action, which then leads to there are no independent decisions. So if you decide to give more, you either got to get a bigger pie or it's got to come from someplace else. But nobody gets more than five pieces of pie. And then the other thing is, the longer term your perspective, the more important the decisions that you will make today. So the question I have for all of you is, if it all does belong to God, how are you doing when it comes to consuming your pie? How are you doing when it comes to consuming your pie? All right, once you have a handle on the pie, now we move on to the third H, which is developing habits that will help you do money God's way. As I like to say, your habits will decide your future. 
and that applies to all areas of your life. Your habits will decide your future. I was talking about Ron Blue years ago. He was testifying before a correct congressional subcommittee. One of the senators on the committee asked him, he said, Mr. Blue, what advice would you give to the American family? And Ron rattled off the five timeless habits. And the senator said to him, he said, seems to me that that would work at any income level. And Ron Blue said to the senator, he said, you're absolutely correct, Mr. Senator, including the federal government. They're not very good with money if you haven't figured that out. All right, let's jump into the first habit. The first habit, it's, not, it's a no-brainer. Spend less than you earn. Your financial success will depend on this habit immensely. This is why we have to get control of the pie. You also have to have a system for measuring your pie. Because as I like to say, what gets measured gets managed. I'm going to give you a quick story. Everybody heard of the COVID-15? That's the 15 pounds that we all gained during COVID, right? I got to the end of 2020. I'm a fairly fit guy for almost 60. Um, but I got to the end of 2020. I got on the scale. I was a few pounds up. I didn't like it. So you know what I did? I put a weigh-in app on my phone. And for a whole year, periodically, I'd be ready to get in the shower in the morning. I'd step on the digital scale, and then I would record it in the weigh-in app. And literally what happened one year later, I was down about two pounds. Now, here's the amazing part of it. I didn't do anything different in my lifestyle. The only thing that was different is I had a system for measuring. And so what would happen is if I was down, I could have the extra slice of pizza. If I was up a couple of pounds, I would cut back a little bit. Nothing earth shattering or anything like that, but it proved my point of what gets measured gets managed. My wife, by the way, my wife uh, hates that line. <laughs> True story. All right, second habit is avoid the use of debt. Why? Because debt mortgages the future, and as Proverbs 22, 7 says, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a slave to the lender. That's a pretty harsh scripture as it pertains to debt. Now, I'm not totally against debt. I think there's good debt and bad debt, so let's go through that a little bit. All right, bad debt. I don't know if you know this, but all of us in this room are being marketed to like never before. I mean, the social media stuff's crazy. Like, I think they hear us because stuff starts showing up on my phone. I don't know how that all works, but it's spooky, right? We're being marketed to like never before. Here's what the marketers do. No offense, Bob Holdcamp, former marketing guy. They try to make you feel like if you're not doing it or having it, you're a loser, like you don't measure up. And we always have to be careful to not spend money that we don't have for things that we don't need to impress people that we don't like. Some of you probably have heard that line. So the worst, the worst kind of debt, obviously, is credit card debt. And I realize, because I've been broke in my life, so I was broke at age 30, so I know what it's like not to, not to have a lot of provision. Um, sometimes if you have to spend more than you earn, well, the only option you have is to go into debt, and a lot of times it's credit cards, okay? But I will tell you the credit card companies are not your friends because what they would assume is you have a high balance. They charge, I, I heard some of the rates that are out there right now are insane, and they want you to make the minimum payment. That's what they want you to do. Now, I use credit cards. I pay them off every month, every month because I want the points for my traveling because you can, you can really do some really cool things with that. So that is the worst debt. As far as good debt goes, um, I'm not going to get too deep into this, but here's the overriding theme. The economic benefits must outweigh the cost. So a house, is that, is that a good deal in most cases? Yes. Um, education. I think people have got to be careful with these student loans, um, even though the government's probably going to forgive all of them anyway, so who knows. Um, You've got to be careful with that. Um, starting a business, I, I, I've had to go in debt a couple of times. We've done acquisitions, things like that. I think that's a good use of debt. Um, cars, um, we could debate that. Um, I'm a guy that doesn't like cars, and so I always take my wife's hand-me-downs because, I, I don't, like I said, I don't like them. Um, and I pay cash to her and, you know, I, I never have a payment and I drive them for a long time. So anybody seen how it, cars are really expensive these days? It's crazy. Yeah. All right. Third habit, set long-term goals. 
So I want you to real quick, I want you to just think of a moment that you set out to accomplish something and you actually accomplished it. Like you set a goal and you accomplished it. How did it make you feel? How did it make you feel? Because here's one of the things that amazes me is sometimes I feel like Christians are some of the smallest thinkers out there. And I feel like we should be the biggest dreamers, the biggest goal setters. Why? Because we got Jesus. We know how the story ends, right? So that, that's my challenge to you tonight is to, to think big around that. So let's talk about five hallmarks to setting faith-based goals. The first thing is, is pray. God, what would you have me to do? Pray. The second thing is you got to write it down. There's something powerful about writing things down. I have been journaling for over 20 years. I highly recommend it. And what's really cool is to go back into my life and see all of the feelings and thoughts and things that happen, but to see stuff that I wrote down that has come to manifest in my life. So here's what I want you to do real quick. I want you to write down one thing real quick that you want to accomplish in 2022. Just write it down. And then when you get done doing that, the third hallmark is measure. We talked about what gets measured gets managed. Is it a dollar figure? Is it a time deadline? What is it? Put a measurement on it. All right, the, the fourth hallmark is share. And so here's what I've discovered in my own life. When I want to do something, I go out and tell as many people as I possibly can. Because what I've found is it puts the pressure on me that now I've got to deliver. When you testify and say, this is what I'm going to do, there's something magical about that. So here's what I want you to do. What you just wrote down, the person across from you or next to you or whatever, tell them what you just wrote down. Go for it. Back and forth. All right, everybody get a chance to share it. All right. I don't want to get I don't want to get Jim's uh, hand signal, so let's keep going. All right, the last hallmark is this. You got to take action. One of my favorite scriptures is Ecclesiastes 11:4. If you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. And there's too many of us. We are standing at the starting line of life like right here. And it's like on your marks, get set, go. And we're just sitting there going, you know what? Oh, wait a second. We got to get all the T's crossed and the I's dotted. I got to have everything figured out. And I'm here to tell you, I'm almost 60 years old. And here's what I figured out. You get started before you're ready. Every great thing I've done in my life is because I got started before I was ready. Because what I've discovered is when I get started, God starts sending stuff to me. People, resources, know-how, things like that. Too many people suffer from analysis paralysis, so you got to take action. As you navigate these hallmarks, three things. Number one, if you aim at nothing, you will hit nothing every single time. Number two, write your dreams and goals in sand, not concrete, because things are going to change. And to me, it gives you more of a direction, not a destination. And the other thing, I heard this from a guy named Randy Marshall years ago, work your activities, pray for your goals. You have no control over your goals. You have absolutely no control. If you tell me you want to lose 15 pounds, you have absolutely no control. The only control you have is over the activities that you're going to engage in that will give you the greatest possible chance of reaching your goals. I'm convinced of that. So activity is the name of the game. All right, let's move on to the fourth habit. Um, the fourth habit is give generously. Why? Because 
giving breaks the power of money, as Ron Blue would like to say. I want you to think about a time when you were part of an exchange of generosity. Receiver, giver, either way, how did it make you feel? How did it make you feel? Two things I want to address tonight. The first question is this, is how much should you give? And the answer is, I don't know, because that's between you and God. But I love this scripture right here. I won't read it to you, but I just have this image of a cheerful God. Like when I took my envelope and I stuck it in the mailbox because nobody was in the office, I just picture this cheerful God saying, way to go, Mikey. Way to be faithful with what I've given you. The second question is, when is the best time to start giving? And I think a lot of people are like, you know what? That giving thing sounds great, and I'll get around to it when I make some more money. I'm here to tell you, 14 years ago after that sermon, I did it backwards. I said, I got, I got to get going on this thing. And it was frightening because you're thinking, oh, my God, is this going to affect my lifestyle? What if my wife gets mad at me because I'm being too generous? But the thing that inspired me every step of the way was Malachi 3.10, which I read in the book. There was just something about that scripture and, and God just saying, test me. Just give it a shot. See what happens. And that's what's led to this amazing 14 years. All right, the last habit is plan for financial margin. Why? Because the unexpected will occur. We're, I, everybody in here, I think, is old enough. There's Stuff's happening in life, right? And I love the scripture about the ants. You know, there's, there's nobody running the show or anything, but they just instinctively know that there's different seasons and we got we to gotta prepare for the unexpected. So the question I have for all of you tonight is, what are, what are you doing to prepare for the unexpected? What are you doing to prepare for the unexpected? And I'll talk more about financial margin here in a minute. So, what, so I, I gave you five timeless habits. What are your current habits right now? As you sit here tonight, what are your current habits? Are they in alignment with God's will for you? And are they moving you in the direction of your dreams? Are they moving you in the direction of your dreams? Now, to change a habit, um, I believe that you need a plan of attack. It's always nice to have people that are there to encourage you and hold you accountable. And based on the latest research that I did, on average, it takes about 66 days for something to stick. 66 days for something to stick. All right. The last H is hope. There's only one thing that can create hope for the future, and that is margin. That is margin. And Ron Blue created this thing called the margin meter, which is in your handouts. And um, it's just an indicator of where are you as far as having margin in your life. In an idyllic world, it'd be great if we could have everybody stable, secure, and surplus. I've, I've always wondered, when I sit in church sometimes on Sunday, I wonder sometimes, as I look around at all the people, how many people are not being what God called them to be because they have to spend all their life worried about money and possessions. And that's why this margin thing, I think, is so important. It's also why we have to get the first habit right, which is spend less than you earn so that we can create margin. And we also have to spend less than we earn so that we can reach our dreams and our goals. I just don't think that God wanted life to just be this financial struggle that I see so much out in the world. And I realize, like, you're not talking to somebody who was born with a silver spoon. I know what it's like not to have it and to have it. Uh, and I'm humbled by it, but I just don't think that God designed it that way for us. And here's what I found over the last 14 years is I got my heart right, got my health right, and I started living these habits and started creating more financial margin. I just found that I had more confidence, I had more freedom, had more peace of mind. And I believe me, I don't take it for granted because I, I just, God, it's yours, whatever you want to do. All right, let's bring this in for a landing and then we'll do some Q&A.
Um, in his book, um, Extreme Money Makeover, I think most people know this is Dave Ramsey. Um, and I'll tell you a quick story about Dave Ramsey. Um, Ron Blue, the co-founder of Kingdom Advisors, was speaking to a group of pastors out in um, Colorado, and they did the Dave Ramsey thing. And the church saved millions of, they got, they got rid of millions of dollars worth of debt, like 30-some million. And the pastor said to Ron Blue, he said, but I'm a little perplexed. He said, we got rid of all this debt, but our giving, we haven't even moved the needle. It's still the same. He said, what's up? What's going on with that? And Ron Blue turned to the, to the pastor and he said, that's because Dave Ramsey is more transactional and Kingdom Advisors is more transformational. So I don't think Ramsey's in the heart changing business. And I don't want to diminish because I think he provides a great service. Um, but I love this quote, live like no one else. So later you can live like no one else. That's the essence of doing money God's way because the secular world's not going to give you this messaging. And the, and the secular world is going to be up against us every step of the way. And if you have kids, you, you know the drill. I mean, trying to, trying to fight that battle. All right. As we finish up here, I want you guys to be thinking about four things tonight. Number one, where's your heart? Because all money issues are heart issues. Number two, how are you doing with your pie? How are you doing with your spending? Because all spending decisions are spiritual decisions. What are your habits? What are your habits? Because your habits will determine your future. And then how much financial margin do you have? Because margin creates hope. And I got to tell you guys, 14 years ago, I had no clue I would go on this journey. Had no clue. I mean, it's, I love the fact that I wrote that down in July of 08. Um, I had a little bit more hair back then. Um, but I had no, no clue that I would go on this journey. And as I was driving out here tonight, I had one hope for tonight. I just hope there's one person here tonight that this becomes the start of the journey, the start of the journey. That's my hope. And the other thing I was thinking about as I was driving out here is at the end of the day, why should we do money God's way? I mean, why should we? And I came up with this scripture right here, which is Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Um, he told us to store it up in heaven, not to store it here on earth. And I think when we do money God's way, I think that's really what we're doing is we're trying to store our treasure up in heaven.